This always works. Right? Always works. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers first for having me here. Great pleasure. Um, so today I'll be talking about cooperative transport in ants. And uh, I guess this uh, conference is all about a collective uh, phenomenon in, in uh, biology, and we know that there's many, many examples. We've seen some wonderful ones here where we have many similar more or less similar entities interacting to produce some whole which does more, gives more than the parts, new kind of phenomenon. So we have many examples of this in nature, but the theoretical language by which we should describe this, if it even exists, it's, it's not, not too clear what it is. And uh, one field in which we have some tools for describing uh, large systems of similar particles is physics. Okay, so we have some, some decent uh, tools that were developed over the years. And, and the question that arises is, can we take these tools or, or these phenomena that we know from physics and try to use them to understand, to understand these uh, collective biological groups? And uh, so it's interesting how, how far we can get, but it's also interesting perhaps how, how, when we'll stop, okay? when, when, what, what is the limits of this approach because when we look at these systems, we have a tendency to, to call them cognitive. Cognitive. Well, these physical systems are indifferent. And the question is, where does this arise? Okay, if we, if we could just describe all these systems by very simple physical laws. So where does this, at least intuitive difference, if it even exists, arrive from? So this is the, the, one, this is the, the approach that I'll be trying to, to convey in this talk. And, uh, I study ants, and, uh, and to, to, to approach this question that I, that I just uh, talked about, you need two necessary things. One of them is because we want to look at the relations between the individual and the group. Okay, so it, it's good if uh, experimentally you can track each individual and all individual, okay, ants in our cases. So there's one thing, and the second thing since we're interested in this uh, indifferent versus uh, cognitive, okay, we better give the, the animals some kind of a goal, a clear collective goal. And these two things are, are typically not that, uh, not that simple to achieve in, in many biological uh, systems. And uh, luckily in ants, it's a bit simpler. So actually all, all uh, we have to do is go to the nearest uh, shop, grocery shop, get a box of Cheerios, take one of them, and, go to the, and then go outside to the field near our building, put, put the, this Cheerio near the ant nest, and now we get all this for uh, free, or for the price of, of a Cheerio. Okay, because first, we've provided the ants with a very clear goal. They want to get this Cheerio from where it is to the nest as fast as possible, okay, well-defined, very, we know exactly what they're trying to do. So this is one thing, and the second thing, Another thing is, is a, this is a collective behavior, okay, so no ant can move it on, on, its, on her own. It's very heavy for a single ant, very big, so we get a, a collective goal. Sorry. Another thing, everything is just confined to this uh, small area. We can easily see everything, track everything, each ant and all ants. Okay, so this is what it looks like after it's tracked, if you can see the, the numbers here. So, this is in the, in the field. We don't have to tag them or anything. The ants' legs are pretty spread, so it's, so it's easy to differentiate between them. And they're going t towards the nest. And the bonus is cooperative transport is a, is a very physical kind of phenomenon, right? There's forces, there's motion. Okay, so the, these are the kind of, uh, kind of uh, things we're used to deal with with physical tools. Okay, so pretty easy. Okay, maybe straightforward uh, interpretations that we can use here. 
Okay, so again, we're trying to take our approach. We're going to try to look at the ants as particles okay, and see how far we can go. So first thing you need to do when you move a large, uh, a large object is you need some kind of consensus in the application of forces. Because if you carry something big together and each person, each ant, pulls in a different direction, you're not going to get too far. You're not going to be too efficient. And here we're going to see some microscopic evidence for this. So this is a side view. And you can see that this kind of slant of the object, it's tilted in this direction. These ants here are pulling, while those in the back are lifting. Okay? So there is some kind of consensus. Okay? The ants are not just pulling randomly everywhere, but some kind of order in the system. And we can think of two possible explanations for this. One is that we have smart and independent ants. Okay, I'll, I'll discuss them in the next slide. And the second, very simple ants, like particles, but coupled. Okay, so let's look at the, f and, and the, uh, sorry. And before we compare the two models, which I didn't uh, describe yet, actually, the, the experimental evidence, which I'm going to pit them against, is the trajectory smoothness and speed as they depend on group size. Okay, so in the lab, we can prepare these uh, artificial objects. Okay, so these are not cheerios, so we can, cheerios are very uniform in size, of different sizes, and check the characteristics of the motion. So we can see that the very large object, the blue here, go in very smooth lines, while the smaller object, they wander around much more. Okay? So this is one thing. And, and second thing, the large objects move faster than the smaller ones. Okay? So these are two observations, first observations that I want you to remember. Okay, so now let's look at our other two models. First is smart and independent ants. Okay, so the single ant rule is here, you're smart. Okay, you know where the nest is, grab the object, and pull in that direction, independently of others. You don't care what the others are doing. Act as if you were alone. Okay, and then, so this, that's what all the ants are doing, and then we can calculate the forces, etc. and the collective motion is just overdamped motion. Of course, the ants are applying force, but it doesn't mean they're accelerating forever. Okay, so, so actually, the, the speed is proportional to the total force of all ants. And the consequence of this is wisdom of the crowds. Okay? So what is the total force that we get on the object? It's just the sum of all forces. Okay? So it's just like averaging many, many forces. And the more ants we have, if each of them has some notion of where home is, but there's some no noise in this, okay? if each of them is making a mistake, then the more ants we have, we get a better and better estimate, okay? or they get the total force is a better and better estimate of the correct direction to the nest. Okay, so this is like the this wisdom of the crowds, like the law of large numbers, if you want. The more you average, the more accurate you get, but you get the same kind of uh, mean. Okay, so, so the mean stays the same. You get small and smaller fluctuations, but the mean stays the same. Okay, so this means that if we look at larger items where more ants are needed to carry it, we expect to have same mean speed and smaller fluctuations. So this fits with one of our observations. We did get smaller fluctuations for larger objects. But they were also faster. We didn't get the same mean speed. OK, so now let's look at the second uh, model. So here the ants are simpler. They don't really know where home is. So the single ant rule is you're lost. You don't know where to go. Just feel the current direction, feel the force at your point of attachment, and just go with the flow. So if you're, if you're in the front and it's coming towards you, so you pull also. You help the group. If you're in the back, lift. Okay, so we can capture it by this transition rate rules that ants measure the force once every few seconds and decide if they want to pull or lift, switch between pulling and lifting. Okay, so again, they tend to be lift pullers on the leading edge and lifters on the back edge, on the trailing edge. Okay, and the collective motion is again overdamped. So what do we expect to get here? <clears throat> so, okay. One more detail here, sorry, that I forgot to say. So what the ants actually do in our model is they, they take the force that they feel, and if this force is over, okay, so this is the total force that they feel at the point of attachment, if this force is over some force that they have uh, measured, the scale that they have in their head, F independence, F int here, so if the force is over, stronger than this, then they will tend to align. If the force is very weak compared to the scale that they have in, the, in their head, they will just act randomly, and they can pull in the, back, in the front, lift in the back, etc. Okay? So the consequence of this is that if the forces that an ant feel is much 
or independence is much smaller than total force, then all the ants will tend to align. Okay, so there is this force which is much stronger than independence. All the ants will tend to align, and we get high speed and smooth trajectories. On the other hand, if the independence of the ant is very large, so they have a very, <coughs> very high independence parameter in their head, it's very difficult to convince them. Then each ant will pull in a different direction. We will get low speed and irregular trajectories. Okay, so actually, we can achieve these two inequalities either by playing with the independence level, the scale that each ant that the ants have in their head, which is very difficult to do, but we can also play with the total force just by increasing the object size. So it's like playing with the, the social pressure. So very large, very large object, there will be a large social pressure. All the ants will tend to align, and here there's a small social pressure because the to total force doesn't pass this uh, scale. Okay, so we expect to get high speed smooth trajectories for the large load and low speed irregular trajectories for the small load. Okay, so this fits better with this observations, first observations that I showed you. Okay, so, so just a, a, a quick summary here. So it, it seems that our observations fit with ants that act like stupid particles. They don't really know where home is. They just go with the flow and they're trapped in some collective state with a broken symmetry. Okay, so this is actually the same species of ants in different behavior, the ant entrance. And we just put a, like a toilet paper roll around it. They can go, they can escape easily. They can go back, do whatever they want. But they're trapped in this collective state where they go around and around for, for and this maintained itself for 10 days, I think, during which no ant died. Because if an ant got tired, she just went back to the nest, another replaced her. So it, it's really a collective state. Okay, so now, now that we saw that we can describe, okay, we can hope to describe the ants as simple particles, let's go to this uh, next stage where we actually show that ants are important as individuals. So we have two puzzles that are actually left by, by the, this model that I, that I just described. First, it doesn't account at all for directionality. So the, it just says that wherever the object is moving, the ants will try to keep moving in the same direction, go with the flow, but this will not really bring them anywhere to, or to the nest. And second, the, the path that we measure are quite convoluted. And this was very strange for us the first time we saw it because we used to see ant trails that are so straight and nice. And, and uh, so we know that ants as a species and also this species have the propensity to make very straight trails. But here the trail is, the gore has a lot of uh, sinuosity. And this was, was very strange for us. Why, do, why don't they take the straight line if a single ant can do so? And, and uh, we... Um, and I think there, there is uh, some explanation that kind of, uh, what well, I'll describe now, it kind of provides the same answer for these two questions. Okay, so how do the ants find uh, the way home? So here we'll show a short movie. So the ants are carrying the, this Cheerio. They're lost, and they're all trying to just go with the flow, pull in the same direction, but they're going up instead of to the right. So because the path is convoluted, it happens a lot. So they have to somehow be corrected, and let's see how it happens. So now they're going up, the nest is to the left, and soon you see the rescuer, she's coming from the outside, well-oriented, ants like any other insects navigate very well when they're doing free motion. She looks for a place to attach, attaches, and when she attaches, you see a, a very sharp turn to the left. So now they're going very, very much to the left, almost 90 degree turn, which is very strange because it's one ant pulling to the, to the left and the rest are cooperating and going up. You would expect maybe a very, very wide turn. How could she turn them so sharply? <coughs> okay, so, so to, to try and understand what, what is happening here, how, how we got this sharp turn, we went back to the model I, I described before. And, uh, and we simulated it, okay? So we took these ants in, on, on a circular object and they attach all around and they follow these rules that I, that I told you before of deciding whether to pull in the back, lift in the front, measuring forces, etc. cetera. Um, so it's a very detailed model, but finally you actually have, it includes four free parameters, okay? So most parameters you can measure like the, the the friction or the size of the Cheerio, the, the mass of the Cheerio, et cetera, you can measure, you're left with four free parameters. And because we have so many trajectories, we, we have many, by today, many kilometers of, of such trajectories, you can get four different features and many more actually from the, from the, 
fr from the trajectories, okay, like like the speed as a function of the number of ants, the the the, the correlation distance of, of the trajectory, etc. So there's more than f four features, so we can fit it pretty reliably. And what do we see when uh, when we fit the parameters to the natural motion? Okay, so we fit them for for a, a single. Uh, for a single size object on which we did most of the experiments. And what we saw is that the fitted parameters actually places naturally sized loads, okay, which are about one, two centimeters, that's what they carry in nature, large insects, at, at the transition between a random walk and persistent motion. So very large loads go in very smooth trajectories. Okay, what we see here is, is actually the, the projection of, of the speed on, on, a, on the x-axis, for example. So very large load, they have a they have a persistent motion, ballistic, which is, you can see by these two peaks here. Small, no, small uh, objects have just a, something like a random walk because no, none of the ants are cooperating. And natural size objects are in the middle. Okay? So they're not deeply in this area and not deeply in this area. Somehow between two different modes of motion. Okay, we can compare this to the experiment. So we can see here that the curvature of the trails in the experiment for different load sizes and in this in the uh, simulation, okay? So, so it fits. The parameters that we fit for one single size, they actually fit all sizes, and they place us at this transition somewhere between a random walk and ballistic motion. Okay, so what does this uh, tell us? So transitions, we know them from physics, and we try to, t to look in this direction. And to get this into a more uh, physical, uh, physically understandable model, instead of looking at a circular load, we look just at, at this uh, kind of a, of a rectangular load with the anchor attached just in the front and just in the back, just to make things simpler so we don't have all the angles. And the ants can then choose if to be a puller or a lifter according to the exact same rules as I told you before. Okay, so just a simpler model, and here they just move along a single dimension. So they can just move front or back. Okay, so just a simplified version of, of, the, of, the, of the previous uh, model. And actually, even though this, uh, this thing is, uh, is moving, since there's translational invariance, it actually maps to a fully connected uh, Ising model at, at, uh, at uh, thermal equilibrium. We can even write a Hamiltonian for it, which is uh, some, something a physicist likes to do, like to do. And as we know, for uh, Ising models, you get this transition between order and disorder. So f to get really the, the, the Ising model, what you have to do is take the number of particles to infinity, which is the kind of systems we deal with in uh, physics, very, very large systems. And we can see that, that uh, okay, so we take the number of particles to infinity of ants, and then we also have to raise the, this independence parameter at the same time in their head, so we take them both to infinity together, and then we get an exact mapping to this uh, mean field solution of the Ising model, where you get ordered states here, where the ants are not so independent, and they go with the group, and you get a disordered state here, and no, and no speed, okay? So the order parameter is the speed here that you get. Okay, so this is for very large system sizes. It's clearly not we have what we have with, with the ants. We don't have Avogadro or a number of ants, but we can Using simulations, we can see also with the ants going as low as, as uh, 10 ants. I can't even read it from here. Uh, you can see that we get the same behavior even for a very, very low number of ants. Okay, so we get this transition between ordered state where you get a, a collective speed, collective motion, and a disordered state where the thing moves very, very slowly. Okay, and as we said, the ants are positioned, the real system is positioned, positioned somewhere in the middle, okay? not deeply in the ordered state and not deeply in the disordered state. Okay, so what, what could be the, the advantage of being there? So, so th there were, this, was a, this kind of, of a criticality was, was observed in many, many other systems, in the bird flocks, in fish. And, uh, and the idea here is that the system may have very strong responsiveness. Okay, so we know that in physical systems, near the transition here, you have strong susceptibility to external fields. So if you apply a small external field on the... Ising magnet, it will respond very strongly when you are here. Okay, so what is the external field? How can it be here? External field is just a, a constant force that you add to the system. Okay, so this constant force, how can you get it? You can get it by having a single ant, which is not following the rules. She's an informed ant. 
She's just pulling in a constant direction. She knows this to be the direction to the nest. She just pulls there. She acts as an external field. And we expect to have a maximal uh, response to her since the system is sitting here. Okay, so this ant doesn't have to communicate anything to the group the, to, be, to be able to, to get control like this. So she, she might get the control just by, have, by, by the group being placed at this critical position or near this critical position. Okay, so we, can, we add informed ants to the model and informed ants are ants that just attached to the load, so they came from the outside, they're well-oriented, just attached to the load. And the rule is you know best, others don't know, so ignore them, just attach and pull to the nest. Okay, and after about 10 seconds, you consider yourself lost also. Okay, so this comes from experimental measurements. And then you become a regular carrier and go on to, to follow the, the rules before. Okay, so you had the, the ant had its time of, of uh, it's a five minutes of fame, 10 seconds of fame, and then she becomes a regular carrier. Okay, so what does this give us? So in the simplified model, this is just an Ising model. If you take uh, n to infinity, you really get a, a, a divergence of the response. It's a red line here for small numbers or for a, for finite times, you, you still get a peak here. In the full model, we get the same kind of peak, and this is what we think we see here. Okay, so, so this ant is actually not interacting with these ants there. She's just looking for a place to attach. And once she attaches, because the other ants are placed at this critical position, she can get control of the whole system. Okay, so experimental evidence that there is an optimal group size, okay? So <clears throat> if we have a very small load, the, the social pressure or the total force is not enough to impress the ants, and one ant actually does much better when the second ant attaches, they start to fight each other, they go right, left, right, left, and they can't seem to, to, can't seem to coordinate. If you have a large load, as we saw before, it goes in very straight lines, so very smooth, it should be the best, but the problem, if we confront it with an obstacle, so similar to the obstacles that uh, Audrey just uh, showed, except this one's a bit more confusing because there's a small hole in here in the center, it will stay here for 20, 30 minutes. It cannot get the new information. Okay, so the ants are very, very well coordinated with each other, all the carriers, but they're not open to external information that will tell them how to pass. And this natural size load, size of an insect, it walks in lines that are kind of convoluted. Okay, so it doesn't walk in the straightest line possible, but when it hits the same obstacle, quickly gets information of how to pass it. We'll talk about this later, and they pass. Okay, so I think it's, this is a nice, uh, nice result here. That uh, actually, what, what we see is transient leadership. So the, the object is moving towards the towards home. Each time a, a new ant comes, she has influence. She leads for about ten seconds, but then she stops to lead. The object gets lost again, and then another ant picks up, and then another. Each color here is a new leader, and slowly, the, the cheerio goes towards home. Okay, so when you look at an ant system and you ask yourself, okay, is it a distributed system? Is it hierarchical? Is somebody in control? It depends on the time scale here. So if you look at a single uh, five-second period, there will be somebody that is leading the entire group. But there's, some, there's, there's somebody, there's nothing too special about it. If you look at this whole period, there are many leaders. Okay, so the leaders are democratically changing between them. And at a, at a longer time period, it actually looks much more distributed in, in the non-hierarchical system. Okay, so now, so now we, we saw something uh, kind of funny that first I, I described the ants as uh, particles, very simple particles that follow simple rules, but actually what this did is transfer the control to a single ant that was very knowledgeable and she, knew, she knows how to get home. So actually by, by uh, describing the ants as a physical system, we, we move the control to, to, okay, like particles, very simple, we move the control to this single ant which we can't really describe the physics, how she navigates and what she remembers. Okay, this is a bit less like physical laws. Um, but still, maybe, maybe we still have a chance, because all these ants that are coming, in, in most of the examples we saw, they, they just want to pull to the nest, and the nest is always to the west, to the east. Maybe it's still simple, okay? So if you just model them as, as a simple particles that have some attraction to the east, maybe that'll be enough. So let's see. If, if, uh, how far we can uh, still go and, 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 and uh, use this physics language. So what we did is use the invisible constraint. 
And the invisible constraint, it's different than the constraint I showed before, where, which were walls. This is a piece of hair which is tethered here and tied to the load. Okay, the movie was not supposed to begin. Cause, and, uh, and what happens is that the ants go towards the nest. And then when the, when the, when the hair becomes uh, taut, they start this pendulum-like motion. Okay, so we're going to look at this system. It's a, it's a different system than we saw before. It will help us test our, our model as well. Okay, so we want to test our model on, on, a, on a different system. And, and uh, we're going to use uh, this one as, as, a, as a test to, what, to the model we developed on, on the moving in open space. Okay. So in, in the, and the reason that we, we use this invisible constraint is we don't want the ants to have any other information than the nest is in this direction. Okay, so we want the the leader ants to be as simple as possible just to pull towards the south, okay? And this is what we get. Okay, so first, let's try to see if this uh, really supports our model. Okay, so this is, we have, we have these uh, two, two different uh, alternatives, the, the smart independent with the, with, the, with, the, with the averaging and the coupled particles. So in free motion, the, the puller ants in the front could be there for, for two reasons. Either they're going with the direction because, or they're going towards the nest. Typically, these two are, are more or less aligned. Okay, so the trajectory is, is uh, wavy, but more or less goes towards home. So these are aligned. So it's really different, difficult to tell between these two. But when we look at this uh, constrained motion, the direction of transport is different from the direction of the nest, right? They're doing this uh, pendulum. The nest could be there, and they're moving to the right. So here we could see are the pulling ants in the direction of the nest, because they all know where it is, or are in the direction of the leading edge? Okay, and what we can see actually is the slant is towards the direction of transport and not towards the direction of the nest. Okay, so again, this is microscopic support for this uh, coupled particles model. Okay, so the ants are just going with the flow. Okay, second kind of, of support is just to take our model as is, Okay, so this is what we measured experimentally, these kind of uh, shark fin uh, oscillations. So we took, take our model as is, and we just add this uh, piece of hair as a Lagrange multiplier that restricts it to go on, on the circle. So what happens when we do this? For our coupled model, we get very similar kind of oscillations. And for the uncoupled model, all the ants are trying to pull to the nest, so it actually stays near the center. Okay, so they're just trying to pull there and just so the more they are, the, the, the more they'll stay near the center. Okay, and actually doing this, we can get very, very nice fits. So this, so this is the experimental data in blue, and this is this uh, simulation in, in, uh, in red, very similar, and also this is an analytical kind of a model that I will show you next. Also fits very, very well, okay, which is another Another uh, piece of evidence that, that our model seems to be correct, and these oscillations are happening just do not, for, not because any ant is uh, realizing what is happening. Okay, the ants are just following the same rules that they did in open space. Okay, this is just a collective phenomenon, okay, or emergent phenomenon that gives rise to these oscillations. Okay, so let's just try to give a, a very small uh, physical intuition for the oscillations. So here again, we take the simpler model. We have an object that has two sides, front and the back, and it moves along this, uh, along this circle, so we can vary theta. And we can write a very simple equation for this. So we have the informed ants. They just come in as a force towards the nest. So we, G here, like gravity. And we have the uninformed ants kind of give the, the object its momentum, so they, it, they keep on going left and right. So we can capture it by these equations. I won't go into it, of course. And we can linearize it. So if we linearize it, we get an equation of the speed change according to the speed. And we can see that if here, if this uh, thing here is negative, so the speed uh, change varies negatively with the speed. And this can give us, OK, so this happens with a, for a small number of ants. The number of ants here is n. For a small number of ants, we can get a fixed point at zero, zero. Okay, so this is negative. If you get a, a speed in the right direction, it will pull you back to the left. So for a small number of ants, we expect it to be stuck at zero. But what happens if the number of ants becomes larger, and then the ants starts actually to feel each other, the social pressure, they start to cooperate. So what happens when the number of ants goes over this? 
so when the number of ants becomes higher, okay, we get the, these, this is what we think, we get these oscillations in the experiment. So you can see in the oscillations, the speed is practically, okay, decreases here, but almost constant for, for the entire range of motion. And then there's a abrupt flip and it goes to the other side and then again, it's almost constant. So the, the change in the speed is almost zero. Okay, so if we, if we write the, the change of the speed as a derivative of this energy function, okay, so we just took the formula we had here, the change of the speed, and we give this, we, we write this as a derivative of an energy function, so this is like a Landau energy. We can write this energy, so this is just the same formula as before. But now we can plot this energy at different locations along the trajectory, and this will give us intuition for, for the oscillations. So what happens? When the object is at the center, the force of the, these polar ants is uh, just totally canceled by the, by the string so that we can forget about them. And what we have is just the lifter, just the other ants, the uninformed ants, just trying to cooperate with each other. So they want to move together. They have two alternatives, either left or right, and the two alternatives are equally probable. And you can really see it in this uh, W function, in this uh, Lando energy. You have these two valleys, and you spontaneously fall into one of them. So one, now you got the system got a positive speed. It starts to move to the right. When it starts to move to the right, now the informed ants that are coming and pulling towards the nest, this gravity, now they have an effect, okay? Because they're not totally canceled by, this, by the string, and their effect is in the opposite direction. So actually what happens, if you plot this function, you see that the peak here, the valley here, becomes smaller. And then becomes even smaller until at some point, it loses stability, and the system has to fall to the other side. Okay, so, <clears throat> so actually, the system, this will tell us that different load sizes will give us different collective modes. The, more, the larger the load size, the larger the oscillations. And this we can see in, in the experiment and in theory. And uh, in this uh, modeling, this physics-like modeling, even predicted a third kind of, uh, which doesn't work, Sorry, no, it doesn't work, sorry. A third kind of, of a regime, which I had the movie here, but somehow it skips it, where the, actually the, the object can do full rotations around its axis. So my time is completely over? A few minutes. Okay, so I'll go into, so, so what we saw here, okay, so unfortunately there's not, not the experimental evidence, but it, it fits quite well. So what we saw here, that we, again, we can describe the system very nicely as a, as a physical system, as ve, the, start, describe the ants as very simple particles, which we can track using physical tools. Okay, so this was in a very simple system as well, with this invisible uh, kind of constraint. Okay, but now when we go to a more natural systems, then we see that the ants actually profit from both the individual and the group, okay? So it's not one or the other. We need both the collective effects and the intelligence of the individual ants. Okay, so natural environments look more like this. So this is a natural uh, movie, which was not staged at, at all. So there's a leaf here, and the ants are carrying the seed. So the ants easily pass from left to right, but the seed can't, and then they have to go and find a way where the seed can actually pass. So we kind of s simulated this uh, here. We bring the ants uh, an obstacle. Here the, the ants can pass easily. It's the fastest way to the nest, but the tree cannot pass. Okay? And what happens? So it's a confusing kind of obstacle. They think they could go here, but the real solution is from the side. And actually we see that they solve this in linear time. Okay, so how do the ants do this? For, so for this we have to add a new kind of uh, information to the system, which is the scent marks that the ants employ. So the ants actually employ scent marks while they're carrying the loads. And the scent marks, you can see the ants here, she's touching the, the end of her, her uh, gastro to the floor. She's applying a scent mark. And the nice thing is you can see this behavior from the top. So it's a very stereotypical behavior. She walks a bit backwards. You can see it from the top. You don't need a side view, which means that even when you look at a single ant from the top, you can infer just from the movie where exactly she laid those scent marks, which we add here in animation. And these scent marks also appear during the cooperative transport. So here the chair is moving and we plot, this is, this is a real experiment, we plot the scent marks that the ants have laid and the chair is moving on top of them. And we see the chair lost the scent marks and a new trail formed here. The is moving on it, loses it again, and a third trail forms here. So the trail is always deforming 
according to the location of the, the Cheerio. Okay, so the, the trail is morphing and leading the Cheerio at the same time, both leading each other. Okay, and the nice thing here, when we follow the scent marks, we learn that the individuals cannot solve these kind of problems alone. So when individuals see these kind of obstacles, they actually mark towards the shortest route to the nest, okay, which here is under this leaf where the object can't pass. Okay, so even if you take many such animals and you average all of them together, okay, even if, if a few animals will see, a few ants will see their way around, the average will be towards the center. Okay, so, so, so doing this kind of a wisdom of the crowds doesn't work here at all. The wisdom of the crowds is telling you to go forward while the answer is through the side. Okay, so individuals and averaging individuals doesn't work at all. They have misguided information, which is on the wrong scale. Okay, the group also cannot solve the problem at all. If we remove knowledgeable individuals by blocking the ways from the side, we can see that instead of solving these obstacles linearly, it takes them at the group exponential time. So the group also can't solve it alone. Okay, so both do not suffice. So how do the ants actually manage to, to quickly circumvent the obstacle? So I don't know if to give the answer or not. No, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so to understand this, we looked at all the scent marks that the ants lay near the obstacle, and what we found that the scent marks here near this opening, they're actually like a road sign that's pointing up. So these are wrong. But the scent marks, if you go here, more to the side or here, they are all to the right. To the right. So here, the scent marks that are far from this entrance are to the right, okay? So the ants are marking, the ants know their way around, and they give these possible solutions. And this stays constant over time. So we have this error here. It's constant over time. It's always an error, but it's also confined in space. Okay, so we have areas, the representation is wrong, but it's quenched in time, confined in space. Okay, so, so how do, how, when you have this, uh, I'm trying to speed up. When you have these kind of uh, rules or, or uh, road signs that are sometimes wrong, typically correct, sometimes wrong, what do you do? How can you, get, how can you use them to get to your destination? And what we find is the ants use this by applying a, this locally blazed trail, which is they apply each ant when it marks, it doesn't mark all the way to the nest. It just lays like small 10 pheromone droplets, for example, 10 centimeters, and goes back. So it's like a little arrow telling you, telling the object where to go next. Okay? So the, the trajectory is not fully planned in advance. Okay, just the next step each time. So this is one part of it. And the other, the group follow these trails, but not religiously. Okay, so the group tends to go along these scent marks, but often loses them, as we saw in the movie before. Okay, so this is a different kind of trail than the one we typically know, which is very, very well defined and constant over time, mostly. Okay, so now why does this algorithm work? Okay, so here we want to get from A to B, so a very simplified version. Mostly we have the correct instructions, but sometimes we have the wrong instructions. Okay, so there can be few possible approaches. First, you trust. You say, okay, most uh, instructions are correct. I'll follow them. The person who put them there wants my best. But if you do this, you'll get stuck here forever. So this is infinite time. Second is disillusioned. So they're sometimes wrong. I'll just forget about them altogether and then just do a random walk. So this will get you to be, in, but in quadratic time. And third thing, which is what kind of what the ants do, is follow with probability. You typically follow, but not always, the next arrow. And on stretches of good advice, this gives you biased random walk, which is linear. On stretches of bad advice, it gives you exponentially long, because you're doing a biased random walk against the bias. But these stretches are rare, because usually the advice is for you. So together, you can analyze it. You get linear time. Okay, so this is the reason why people have this uh, dice in, in cars. OK, and actually, when you follow, so I want to uh, I won't go into it because I, my time is out, I guess. But when you follow what the ants are doing, this is really what they're doing. So the, the reason that they're not stuck here near the center is sometimes they, they, uh, they, they don't follow advice and they go elsewhere. And then they pay for it. Okay, so the ants here paid for it because here they could have followed the advice and, and uh, escaped. But still here they chose not to follow it and they go against their interest and back. But the price you pay here is minimal when compared to the price you gain here. Okay, and you get this linear time. So the, the, what I wanted to, to summarize or looking at the future is to try to say that ingredients for this collective uh, cognition that we say we have cognitive systems is you can use this collective phenomenon in physics, can get you very far, but it will not give you 
cognition, at least for the ants, and for this you have to add these navigationally competent, goal-oriented individuals. And you need information to transfer between these two all the time, okay? So in physical system, usually you can, you can forget about the microscopical details. Here, no, here they keep on being important, even when you go to the group level. And then we want to understand, take this for the future, and try to understand, okay, what can this give us? What, what is, the, what is the, the class of problems that the ants can solve using this? And we try all kinds of different mazes. So here you can see the ants trying to go through this uh, rock field. The ants can easily walk straight, but what they're carrying has to take a very different kind of path. And we're trying to understand theoretically, okay, do we expect the ants to solve this? Don't we? And what, what kind of puzzles do we expect them to solve and what we don't? So you can follow the trajectory of what they're doing until success. Okay, so thank you very much. Sorry for being over time.